All right, well, it's two minutes after nine, so we can get started. I'll kick off today's conversation. Um, I see a few people have joined us. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And this is our final session in this amazing series. It seems like we just started yesterday with these conversations. And yet the day that we had this, it was cold and snowy back in February. Um, and today is beautiful and sunny. So it just shows the journey uh, that we have taken and how far we've come. We started uh, these conversations thinking about the value of mentoring and developing relationships to help young people. Um, we also talked about how to appropriately use social media and the power of talking about current events with young people. Then we dove into a conversation about the value of peer mentorship and how to develop our own self-care plan. This series has been a wonderful collaboration between the Jewish Healthcare Foundation and the Mentoring Partnership. Uh, so with that said, I'll introduce myself. I am Sophia Duck from the Mentoring Partnership. I am our training and engagement manager. Uh, and alongside me, we've had some uh, amazing conversations uh, with uh, individuals on the screen and some additional individuals. Uh, so I'll give room for... Um, two others on the screen uh, to introduce themselves, and then I will share with you the others who have also collaborated in making this series possible. Michelle, do you mind getting started? Sure, good morning, everyone. Michelle Thomas, Director of Training and Program Development with the Mentoring Partnership. Um, just to echo off of Sophia's reflections, we, you know, we started planning this series last year, and I think today's topic, not even knowing even more how timely that it would be. So really excited um, to, not even really excited, just to, to amplify this conversation today. And I think there's so much to learn um, and moving forward. So thank you all for being here. And my name is Carol Frazier. I'm from the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Um, and I'm kind of sad that this is ending today, but I think um, we'll find other ways to collaborate in the future. I am part of the uh, Teen Mental Health uh, Initiative at the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Um, and I'm so excited to see us begin to talk about uh, integrating mental health uh, into these spaces with everything um, that you all are doing on the ground. I think uh, you're doing mental health work, uh, but maybe haven't seen it as mental health uh, previously. I'd also like to share um, or introduce Deborah Murdoch, who is our Adolescent Behavioral Health Program Manager at the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Uh, she's been a very uh, instrumental part of this uh, collaborative too. She can't uh, be here today, um, I can share that she has uh, just welcomed a new little girl to her family. So uh, keep her and her new family uh, in your thoughts. Uh, I'm sure she's thinking about us this morning um, and that a part of her wishes she could be here, but she's at home uh, bonding with her new baby. So thank you, Sophia. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for uh, lifting that up. So the four individuals you see on the screen um, have uh, done a lot to make this series happen, but we also want to give a shout out to Kristen Allen from TMP, Sarah Pessy, and Elise Palco from the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, and all of the work uh, that they have done behind the scenes, as well as being on, ca on camera here a few times and uh, taking some of the amazing notes and just sharing and being a part of this journey as well. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, like we should take, a, uh, I just want to let you all know, that we plan to take like a uh, maybe a group photo at the end of this, um, just of all of the, the great conversations we've had and the, the opportunity to be able to bring this series together has been a wonderful experience. And I, I echo Carol's thoughts and we don't want this to end yet. So we'll talk about what that could mean as we continue today. So just to recap, um, I did share a little bit about what each session has included, but our very last session, uh, we focused on tips for boosting youth mental health and well-being. Uh, we were joined by Still Smiling, an organization in residence at Neighborhood Allies, uh, and they shared mindfulness practices. How are you? Well. Hmm? 
They share, we shared mindfulness practices, enhancing peer support, active deep listening, and ways young people can identify supportive adults within their networks. Uh, on this slide, you'll see three of the graphics that were created. The first talks about the value of creating a mental health safety plan. Uh, in the middle, we see the importance of self-care and recognizing that we base our self-care activities around things that we can control in our lives. Uh, so just to talk a little bit more about that one, some journal questions to consider are what are some things that you can control in your life and how can you connect them to your self-care routine? And then lastly, we have uh, a deep breathing activity that you can use. Um, that is highlighted in the third graphic on the screen. So all of these graphics are part of our post-meeting notes on the website that you can access uh, as needed, um, in addition to all of the other recaps and videos from uh, this amazing series. So for today, we have uh, a fantastic conversation lined up with you. Uh, we're happy to welcome 8099 Solutions to this space today. Uh, you see on the screen are uh, Akila Donald, Marita Gilcrease, and I'll introduce them a little bit more before uh, they actually get started, but just to share a little bit about uh, 89 Solutions Foundation was created in uh, 2019 by three-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year and Super Bowl 56 champion Aaron Donald. Uh, growing up in Pittsburgh's Lincoln, Lemington, and Belmore neighborhood, Aaron saw firsthand the positive impact that athletics had on him and his peers. Also recognizing the importance of accessibility to quality education, good nutrition, and community involvement, Aaron sought to launch an organization that prepares Pittsburgh's underprivileged youth for lifelong success. The mission of 89 Solutions, 80, sorry, 8099 Solutions, is to change the trajectory of Pittsburgh's most vulnerable youth by providing necessary resources in a free, safe environment where they can be empowered to excel academically, socially, and athletically. So that's a little bit um, about 89, 80, 99 solutions. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit more about Akita and Arita in a few slides, uh, but I want to introduce today's topic a little bit and make the case for why this conversation is so important. Um, Michelle talked about how timely it is. Uh, so I'll jump into that and then make room uh, for these uh, amazing women to share more with you. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, this, and as, I, as I, I also echoed, uh, the timeliness that Michelle shared of this conversation is recognizing how important it is to think about mental health and the physical health of athletes. Uh, so when an athlete needs time to recover from a sprained ankle or a broken limb, you never hear people asking the question why. We can typically see the pain, maybe the swelliness or of the affected area, um, or even see how it limits them while they're in competition. And then as the public eye or the fan, we typically wish them well. Um, maybe even sending letters of support. Uh, I say letters jokingly, right? Because now it's just a tweet or <laughs> a shout out on social media. But thinking about how it's uh, what their physical health is doing and how it limits them to being effective. So with that, the other hand of it is when an athlete who is seen as larger than life and full of grit needs to take a seat because of their mental health, we question it. So today's conversation during Mental Health Month is focused on asking the question, why do we take physical health of athletes more serious than their mental health? And through this whole journey, we focus on the mental health of young people in general. Um, today's just specifically thinking about um, our athletes and those in any type of physical competition. So as we dive in today, I want you to remember that athletes are humans and they face anxiety, depression, and other challenges just the same. 
On the slide, you have a word cloud of athletes and word connected to statements that have been made about their mental health in recent years. The athletes that are listed on this screen, just in case, um, in is way of uh, highlighting their um, public uh, attention to their mental health is Olympic snowboarder Chloe Kim, Olympic gymnast Simone Bowles, tennis stars Naomi oh, Osaka and Serena Williams, Olympic swimmers Caleb Dressel and Michael Phillips, former wrestler and actor Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and then NBA players Demar Rosen and Kevin Love. So as we think about those professional athletes and those Olympians, I want to now transition to think about our student athletes um, and think about the way that they have to balance the everyday stress of academics, practice, game schedules, community engagements, and being perfect while doing it all. So on the screen, big black letters are the words stress to be perfect, which is something that a lot of our student athletes have had to deal with, the stress of having to be perfect. In the last two months, we've heard the passing of three student athletes who died by suicide. This stunned their families, coaches, teammates, campus at large, and the nation. So just to highlight the three individuals I'm talking about um, and to bring attention again to this cause, uh, we have uh, Stanford soccer player, uh, Katie Meyer uh, on March 1st. We have April 13th was Wisconsin track athlete, Sarah Schultz. And then on April 25th, we learned of James Madison softball player, Lauren Burnett. So on the screen, on the other side of the stress to be perfect quote is a tweet that I found from a women's hockey player, Kennedy Blair, who said there is a time during the season where she had to step away and take a few days due to her mental health. She goes on to add that she had support from her coaches, teammates, and the staff, and wished that more people understood and accepted the challenges that student athletes go through. I personally used to work at a university and would often find myself in conversations with fans who were very passionate and they would ask me, what happened to such and such during this game? What was so off about this part of their game? And I would often find myself responding to, well, it's midterms or it's finals. And this morning they had to take a test before we flew out. And I was often matched with, well, what does that have to do with what they're doing on the court? And so often it's lost that those two things really do have a lot to do with each other. So we are going to share with you in the chat, um, if, and sorry if I missed it, um, but information about National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, uh, crisis support, and then also lifting up our friends and thinking about uh, peer mentorship as well. Uh, so I can share a lot of stories about my experiences working um, with collegiate athletics. I can also talk from the perspective of a coach um, because I do coach youth sports and thinking about the fact that this season alone, I have heard and even witnessed several mental breakdowns from our young people. Uh, so I know the value of sports that can be both a stress reliever, but then also a stress inducer. The return to sports this season was so exciting, um, yet has also been scary. Coaches, teachers, parents all want the best for each student athlete, but they don't realize how stressful it is to be great while also being 9, 12, 15, or even 18 years old and just wanting to be a kid. So this season, I made it my own personal mission to think about the fact that in practices, I don't use the word push, but instead, are you okay today? So with that, um, and not deciding to continue to talk about all of 
uh, the stories that I have. I would love for you to hear from a young person themselves um, talking about what youth sports can be and sometimes what it often is. So I am going to stop sharing for a second so I can see all of your beautiful faces and go to video. Um, because the video that we had embedded is not working and I want to make sure. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to share this video and then um, feel free to add your comments to the chat and thoughts as you uh, hear Derek talking about his youth sports experience. I'm here to announce my retirement from sports, baseball, basketball, all of them. I feel like it's time. The pressure that it takes to play at my age is just too much. So I'm done with the endless advice from parents to keep my head up, to keep my head down, to keep my head in the game. I know, I know you think you helped. I'm walking away from the coaches that left me on the bench every time the game was on the line. I'm sure they'll agree I'm leaving at the peak of my career. I'll miss my friends and the fun we had when we were young. I said I'd play this game as long as I was having fun. And now, it's time to call it quits. Any questions? Who do you think can fix these issues? Um, parents, leagues, coaches. Everyone. What are you going to do with all your free time? Whatever's fun. Thank you. All right. So I would love to hear your thoughts. And again, you want to add them to the chat. Uh, and thinking about Derek and uh, comments around leaving the sport that he enjoy playing. Um, I, I want to echo the fact that Derek also mentioned that uh, when being asked what could have made the game better, uh, he started to list who could have been more helpful and then it was everyone, right? So recognizing that every one of us um, who was attached to a young person who was playing sports plays a part in that great experience um, that they can have. And in that video, um, which was wonderfully done, I think, um, Derek is nine and walking away from what can be an amazing future um, because of the pressure to be great at nine years old. Uh, so I just wanted to pause there, definitely um, hear your thoughts and responses uh, to that. And I'm looking at the chat if I can have um, seen a few thoughts there. I appreciate that. I can go back to sharing my screen um, and I will make room. Uh, so again, I just wanted to lift up a few things to really think about uh, the way that sports can be fun, engaging, exciting, a stress reliever, um, but also uh, something that can induce stress and create anxiety, depression, and so many other mental health challenges for young people, um, even as young as nine. Uh, so that said, I'd like to introduce you to our friends from 89 uh, Solutions um, with a brief bio. Uh, so you already had a chance to see their lovely faces um, as I talked about uh, 89 Solutions Foundation, but I want to specifically lift these two women up. Uh, so Akita Donald is a mental health therapist and the executive director of AD 99 Solutions. 
Uh, she also works as adjunct fa faculty at Slippy Rock University, where she teaches undergraduate sociology and nonprofit management courses. Akita currently serves as a board of directors for Youth Opportunities Development and Penn Hills Youth Football and Cheer Association. After years of working inside the prison system, providing mental health services to inmates, she is passionate about intercepting the school to prison pipeline. Akita has a bachelor's degree in sociology with a minor in psychology and a master's degree in professional counseling, specializing in trauma from Carlo University. She also holds an alcohol and drug certification. Next, we have Marita uh, Gilcrease. Uh, who is the program coordinator for AD99 Solutions Cornerstone Program Prep Forward. With a passion for coaching and a talent for winning, Rita is a coach, author, and the athletic culture expert, also the founder of Rita Speaks Life, LLC. She is made, uh, sorry, she has made it her mission to lead teams to victory, whether they're in the locker room or a boardroom. Before joining AD99 Solutions, the Pittsburgh native served as assistant coach of women's basketball at Ryder University in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Rita brings six years of Division I experience and leadership and team building skills, which she uses to help student athletes develop a winning mindset on and off of the field. Rita holds a bachelor's degree in international business and business administration with a minor in French and a certificate in leadership from Ryder University. She also has a master's degree in international human rights from the National University of Ireland Galway. Akita and Rita, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Hello, thank Hello. you guys. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you. All right, so um, we're going to talk about coaching student athletes through mental health challenges. Sophia did a really great job with, you know, um, introducing our, our, our topic of discussion. So next slide, please. I will very briefly go over the organization as a whole. So our philosophy is that youth in more affluent communities are not stronger, not smarter than kids and maybe like Homewood or Lincoln, right? When it all boils down to it, those, those uh, youth in maybe Mount Lebanon or Fox Chapel, they have uh, access to greater resources, right? They have better education system, they have social capital. And so really what the organization is, is designed to do is to quote unquote level the playing field. Um, and how we do that is through education and allocation of resources. So while we serve as student athletes, we are not an athletic program, we are an education program. Again, designated to providing education um, and allocation of resources. Next slide. Thank you. So as Sophia mentioned, our cornerstone program is our prep forward program, which I'm so pleased to be the program coordinator for. And what we do, as it says here, is we help student athletes 13 to 18, both male and female, prepare for post-secondary education. And most importantly, there, there's that mentor piece to academics and everything it takes to be successful both on and off the field. And what makes this program really unique um, is we incorporate the families. So we're looking at this ecosystem. We know that we can't just make this, you know, this large impact with this one, this one individual who's a minor, right? But just being mindful that with this program, the whole goal is to get them to post-secondary education. So we want, we want them to get there. And we know that the families are a vital tool. Um, and so we do a lot of um, family engagement. And honestly, I, I contribute a lot of the success to our strong parental engagement. So of course, we're dealing with, we're working with athletes. So we do a lot of different things that might be aerobic, aromatherapy, hiking, biking, fishing, Pilates. Um, and so again, we're not just doing this with our students, we're doing this with the family as a whole. So, um, you know, we have parents, um, siblings, grandparents, uncles and, un un uncles and aunts involved, um, and it just makes a world of difference. Next slide. So we have two programs. Um, our first program, Rita explained, that's our cornerstone, that is our baby. Um, 
Prep Forward is designed to um, be really intimate. And so we're very deliberate with keeping the numbers small. So every year um, we have a cohort of five come on. Once they're in a program, they remain in a program. Reed already said, um, we're now uh, having female student athletes, which is this, this is a be the first year. So we're super excited about that. Um, our other program is our community engagement program. And that's just a much further outreach. Um, and so uh, we have a number of, how I describe that is, it's, uh, it consists of community events, initiatives and, proje um, and projects. And again, it's focusing on education and allocation of resources. So on the screen, you see these super cute uh, logos of our different projects and initiatives. And so I'll just go over a little bit about what they are. Um, so our, our Fuel for Success, is our Healthy Snacking Initiative. We partner with Ready Nutrition. We are in um, three high schools. And a whole premise with that is that um, one, nutrition is not something that is, you know, real big <laughs> or, or talked about enough um, with kids from, you know, more disenfranchised communities. And so not only do we provide like nutritional information, but we're also providing access to it. Um, so Ready Nutrition is all healthy. Um, it's all natural products. Um, Mental Flex Forum, which is so timely because we are hosting our first in-person Mental Flex. So like the rest, of the rest of the world, when the pandemic hit, we were like, we had to, we had to suspend all of our in-person um, events and we were like super depressed and then after two days of depression we got with it and developed a mental flex forum and what that is is it has been a virtual learning series and we've touched upon different topics like um, successful mindset entrepreneurship innovation intervention girls and women's rights um, just a multitude of different topics um, and it was so successful the first year that Dr. Teals sponsored last year, um, and we focused on health and wellness. This year, again, in person, um, the event is tomorrow, um, and it is going to be on mental health. Uh, so we have 64 uh, high school students registered, high school student athletes registered, and they're going to come and hear from Aaron about how he stays grounded, what works for him, and a need for them to find what works for them. Um, and so uh, they're going to have like yoga and kickboxing. It's going to be incredible. Um, living in a pocket very quickly. That is our skills camp. We do that every year. It's non-contact. Um, we have that in June. Community defense. That was another project that was designed from COVID. Um, you know, it was super hard to get any uh, masks and gloves and and all that different stuff when a pandemic hit. So we um, successfully distribute uh, PPE to um, black and brown communities um, and uh, provided funding to um, feed uh, vulnerable populations. Um, and we donated some money to one of the local schools so that they were able to, to get Chrome devices for all our students. And lastly, this is our newest baby living in a pocket. Um, it is a youth football coaches um, clinic it is trauma informed. And so it is designed to cover um, things like youth development and being mindful of how trauma impacts youth development, um, but also understanding like this, your community, um, <laughs> the trauma that exists within your community and also you as a man, right? How, how your personal experiences, so ACEs, how your personal experiences impacts how you interact with the world, right? Um, and so we do different things like coaching etiquette, like I said, youth development, um, and it's really, really incredible. So we're looking to launch that in July. So that is a lot, but that is what the community engagement um, program does. Next slide. I know it's okay. <laughs> So one of the key things about sports, right, we, we heard from the young man, the, the lovely boy of nine, who talked about some of the pressures, but the reality is this love, the love of sports is so important and so fundamental, right? So it provides that opportunity when it's done right and done well, and it's well-structured and organized to learn how to talk across cultures. You get the opportunity to find your voice, have that leadership. 
you're actively placed into adverse situations that are controlled or that you learn how to strive and fight against those in a way that can help build that inner fortitude. Plus the obvious health and wellness, patient commitment to, you know, that ability to stay and be where you're going to be and commit to it. Now, obviously we're talking about teenagers and students here, but if you're committed to practice, you're committed to a team and you're going to follow through on that commitment. And that is huge for their long-term development. Plus learning those things about your body, how it's moving, how, what it takes to be strong, what it takes to be well, just in yourself, right? And then of course that time management. So if you're going to supposed to be somewhere in a certain amount of time, that you get that thing done. So super excited about what that means and how that all plays a role into what's possible when we really look at mm -hmm. mental health and physical health and bringing them together. So mental health in America, um, the ongoing pandemic has really impacted all of us, right? Mentally, we're all struggling. I see it, you know, from the youth we're working with to professionals, all the way to the students that I'm working with in the classroom. And so we're at this pivotal point. We just don't know how um, this is going to play out long term. Um, and so what we did is we just wanted to include a few stats on the conditions of mental health in America overall. Um, so among children and adolescents, a portion of mental health related emergency department visits for those age 5 to 11, 5 to 11, um, and 12 to 17 increased 24 and 31 percent. Um, over 2.5 million youth in the U.S. have severe depression and multiracial um, youth are at greater risk. And I wanted to include that because we do have a high population of uh, multiracial youth in this area. And so we need to be, as providers, we need to be, be very mindful of that, right? That they have these unique needs. Um, and again, just making it multi-layered, but just, I just wanted to point it, we just wanted to point that out. Um, and uh, nationally, fewer than one in three youth have severe depression, receive consistent mental health which meaning you might be the only line of defense that this youth has access to. And so having this information is very vital. Having the tools is very vital. So we just wanted to kind of engage a little bit of a conversation with you all as far as what does mental health mean to you? And, you know, when you're talking with your students, those that you have access to, do you regard it as something that's the same as happiness? is the absence of mental, mental illness? And what are some of those five indicators that show good mental health? Mm -hmm. So at this point, can we like open it up and we have a bit of a discussion? So what exactly is mental, like what does mental health mean to you? Because it does mean, you know, being a therapist, it looks very different for everyone. You know, healthy mental health looks very different. Um, so I just wanna open up the floor and have that discussion. Anyone? Don't be afraid. <laughs> so I would say it's definitely not the same as happiness because I think you can be sad and still have good mental health. Um, so, and it's not just the absence of mental illness because you might not have a mental illness but still struggle with mental health issues. So I think defining it is actually very challenging because there's not just one thing that mental health is or that mental health looks like, and it is gonna be different for every person. But I would think mental health is caring enough about your own mental state and your emotions that you can cope with things as they come along. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. I can read from Kiana said, taking care of personal self, mind, body, and spirit, Gina said it affects the way we think, feel, and act. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me just see what else we might have in here for those who may not want to come off. Do, do, do. Oh, that was fast. Healthy mental health means being intentional with self care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Kristen. That's beautiful. Like that one. Yeah. Do we have anything else? Anyone else want to contribute to the conversation a little bit? So how might how you view mental health impact um, how you're interacting with your with your youth? Because that's really what it's about, right? 
Yes, Michelle, it is about being proactive, 100%, 100%. I love that, Gina. Doing a daily checking with the youth is so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I So at Slippery Rock, um, last semester, a lot of kids were really, really struggling, right? Um, and this semester, I thought it was a little, this semester, I took that into account, right? And so every morning I do um, daily check-ins and all this is really, hold on, let me see. There you go. This is really all my check-in is, right? It's just scaling them. And so when we were talking about, you know, um, at the end of the semester, like, what are some things that you like about the class? Like literally everybody. Um, and then I got my surveys back. Everybody really, really liked the, the fact that I'm surveying them. I'm doing those check-ins. So in my mind, that's like, whoa, dude, I'm sitting here writing all these lessons, right? Which are incredibly awesome. And the check-in is the most important. So that, that just, again, um, it was Gina, right? Just reinforces the importance of checking in, you know, um, Aaron says, understanding where challenging behaviors come from, yes. why they're acting out or picking fights, 100%, yes, yes, 100%. Yes. And if I just may add, as far as those of us that may be coaches or, you know, in connection with student athletes on a day-to-day -day basis, creating the space for them to have that conversation before mm -hmm. you dive into your practice plans or whatever other lesson you may have for the day is so important, right? So that we can be on one accord about what's going on right. before we expect to get to an agenda because the agenda is always going to be behind whatever's going on for our young people. And if we can attend to them first as humans, as people, then we can get to whatever goals and, and um, plans we have for that day. Absolutely. So I have a question for you guys. What are five indicators that show signs of good mental health? We're just waiting for some comments to come up. We'll take one indicator if you're feeling confident <laughs> in that one. We'll take one to start. Well, I'll give you, I think good hygiene is a, a great indicator of good mental health. Yes. It's crucial. Absolutely. Setting goals. Keon says setting goals. Absolutely. That's so important. Michelle says, what's interesting about this question is that I can think of some folks that can mask it well. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to what's so important about being here today is mental health has been stigmatized for quite some time to where no one's really felt comfortable talking about it. So we've learned to mask it. We've learned mm -hmm. not to talk about it. So even just in engaging in the conversation, it makes it normal mm -hmm. for us to be open about what we may or may not be struggling with which sets that for us as adults, sets the parameters for a, for any student we may be in contact with to also feel comfortable doing the same. There are some responses I'll let you read off. Absolutely. Kristen says, setting good boundaries to honor your feelings and needs, so important. Kiana also says, ability to express yourself in a positive way, absolutely. Let me see if we have anything else. When no one can say, when you know how to say no and cre create healthy limits mm -hmm. for yourself, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that, what I love about that, especially when you talk about student athletes, we're taught how to keep pushing, keep going, keep mm -hmm. going, right? So that over time, you may be erode some of your ability to say no or when the boundary needs to be there. Or you know what, coach, really, I don't, th I don't think this is gonna be healthy for me. And the better we get at being able to discern what's discomfort versus what's going to be detrimental to your mm -hmm. physical and mental health, I think we'll all be better for it. That's really good points. Really good points. So thank you for that. Next slide. <laughs> okay so just again we're just diving in a little bit so what have you observed or engaged with your athlete or mental your mentees mental health needs right we want to open the floor up so that we can you know ask you how do you currently support your mentees mental health needs and have you noticed anything that will kind of help the effectiveness of your men mentoring your youth any challenges you all may be facing
So you're welcome to come off me or you want to keep dropping in the chat. That's fine as well. We just really want to hear some of your best practices. I will say, um, I kick us off, like as a, as this time of year, a young person who is an athlete, who is also navigating college acceptances, prom, this has been a lot of decision-making that I don't think that they want to make all at the same time. <laughs> and I think that has been a challenge. Um, it's just, as you mentioned, like a lot of times at the beginning of practices, I'll stop and I'll say, hey, what's going on with everybody? Just so I can evaluate how they feel. Um, and it's like, oh, coach, I, I still don't know what I'm wearing to prom. And I got to pick out a limo and we got to figure out. And I'm like, okay, today's not a day to <laughs> ask her to make three different decisions in a, in a certain activity. So um, yeah, just trying to under remember what it was like to be at that age yeah. um and all of the decisions and people expecting you to think like an adult it was just yeah. tough yeah 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 and that's really good that you do that and I think sometimes we get you know we get lost in that not deliberately but sometimes we get lost in that just thinking about what their what their world looks like and, and all the many demands because in our mind we're like you don't have any bills you don't have family you don't have the commitments that you know that we have uh, as adults have but it is still lots and lots of stressors you know um and so it's really important that we we, we remain mindful of that absolutely. especially if we want to be effective oh, absolutely Kristen says, following young people's leads and just creating space, mm. whether they want to talk or just have someone be there. So, so, so important. Yes. Um, just speaking to Akita's point there is if we want to be effective, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes there may not be any other space. There may not be any other one that's willing to give them a listening ear, just kind of sit. And may maybe today we don't talk about anything in particular, but that's just what that student needs. Mm -hmm. So that's what we can give. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. And we call that like just being sometimes just being, you yeah. know, sometimes just playing Uno with the guys, you know, like just, Tic -tac -tac. yeah, like just playing with them. It sounds super corny, but that just existing, just being in that space um, is, is helpful enough. And if I may also add, I think there's also with all the pressures and the stresses, especially get, as you get into high school, it's how fast can you grow up? Yeah. How quickly can you get there? Whereas this is a very precious time, right? So what can we do to make their time in, in youth and adolescence as impactful, as healthy, as fun, as joyous as it can be? Is there going to be some stressors? Absolutely. But how can we help them resist the urge after rush to grow up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a lesson I learned too late. <laughs> trying to rush to grow up. <laughs> Let's get it here. <laughs> Let me see. And then just one more, being supportive and a safe space for them to be able to express their feelings. So important. And assisting them in finding solutions instead of harping on the issue. That part. Yes. And we're going to get to it's that. Like, don't, I, going, yeah. I will circle back to that because that's a whole that's a whole additional piece right there. Next slide, please. Okay. Video. So we wanted to show you, and Sophia is going to pull up the video, but we wanted to highlight Trey. Trey is a former Pitt student. He's 25 years old, and he has been like such a huge advocate um, for mental health. And so he he shares his his journey, um, which it's not, you know, kind of is kind of. Um, in a video kind of sounds like this is the end, but this is just the beginning for this young man. Like he's super incredible. Um, and so we just wanted to highlight his, his struggles um, and what he is doing um, to be a pioneer. Man, I haven't been back to that bridge since the day of. It's a lot of like pressure going back to that bridge. That I don't even know on how I'm gonna react. Next one here is Trey Tipton, wide receiver from Apollo Ridge High School. You know, the thing that's special about him, not only does he have great speed and all that, he looks like a very uh, great route runner, a guy that, when you know, just lights up every room that he walks in. Freshman year, yeah, I came with a lot of baggage, man. I had a lot of, a lot of things sitting on my chest, sitting on my back. Um, at the time, I was starting and playing and 
being very involved into the system, so I was very happy with where I was at. And then the third game of the season, I ended up spraining my PCL, my LCL, and now the one thing that I used to look forward to, that used to keep me sane, is now out of my hands and gone. Then that's when I start to look at myself and say I'm worthless. I was so deep in my own depression, there was no coming out. Man, <laughs> I ended up doing some things to myself and the people around me that I would never ever wish upon anybody. I felt so alone because nobody understood me and I didn't expect anybody to understand me. But the one thing I did understand was that I wanted the pain to stop. And then my final attempt was at a bridge very close to Huntsville. I was staring at the water and I was started moving my feet and preparing myself to jump. I heard something say to me that you're not ready yet. I took my shirt off, dropped it into the water, and I told myself that would be it. I wasn't gonna go back to that. From this day forward, I'm going to be somebody better than I've ever been, no matter what it takes. There's a shotgun snap, throwing for the goal line, and that pass is caught, touchdown, and that is Trey Tipton. Played nine games, was loving it. I vowed to myself that I was a new person. On the ninth game against the University of Miami, I'm coming across the middle to catch the ball. The receiver shaken up, Trey Tipton. That was life-changing, because now, I'm put in a position where I thought that I was going to improve from the time when I was suicidal, and now I'm actually playing with life and death. And it's not by my own decision. And then these group of nurses changed my life completely. They never came in with a negative vibe. They never came in with not a smile on their face. So I vowed to myself that if they're able to smile with seeing these people living like this every single day, there is no reason that I cannot make them smile every single time they see me. I could feel my thoughts kind of transitioning over to, I don't want to be alive. And I started to remember the things that those nurses were saying to me in the hospital back in 2016, when I was like, you know what? I'm going to be the strongest, the most positive person I've ever been in my life. And he sat, you know, he prayed, his faith got stronger, and he wanted to make sure that other athletes had that same help. He understands his gift, and his gift is always showing love to people. And ironically, that's the name of his organization because that really does not embody him. I created an organization. It's called Love, standing for living out victoriously every day. So the goal of the organization was to bring student athletes together to be able to talk about their differences that they've gone through. The important part of it is that you have to find any kind of victory in your life. Even if it's a small victory, it's a victory. When he decided to come back and play the 2020 season, I said, listen, if you come back, you're going to stay healthy. You're not getting hurt. You're going to finish the year. He made it through the entire 2020 season. We hope to get that through 21 as well. Without the University of Pittsburgh, without the people inside of Pittsburgh, there is no Trey Tipton. So I'm very thankful and dedicated and honestly grateful for everything that's been given to me while I've been here. The reason why I'm able to be successful and able to even be here in this moment as we speak is the fact that the city of Pittsburgh has given me the opportunity and God has also blessed me with the opportunity. Sorry, that was a test coming off of mute. So I'll let you go back to the PowerPoint, Sophia. Very powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. Were there anything um, with the video that kind of stuck out for you? Anything that resonated? Um, a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, I so I know Trey actually personally, and I knew that he ran a nonprofit. We were in a lot of the same groups um, uh, whenever we were at Pitt, you know, and he's such a humble person, you know, so whenever um, actually being able to hear his story, I think really moved me. And I thought that it was really inspirational that um, he really wanted to uh, bring joy to people who were trying to help others, like with the nurses and everything. So mm -hmm. I don't, it just, the whole thing really moved me. He's such a nice guy. Yeah. And when you meet him, you don't, you don't, um, you would never know that that's his story. No, no, you know, I, ne you'll I never, never know knew. that's his story. Yeah. All I knew is that he is that he ran a nonprofit. I just didn't realize like how deep it went, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. And then also uh, Kristen said, 
that that the webs of support that helped Trey along his journey, nurses, coaches, moms, etc. And I promise if if we don't leave here with anything else, is that the impact that you can have, positive or negative, unfortunately, is so, so, so critical for these young people, right? We have the power, but we also have the power, right? Mm -hmm. So it's how do we use that to help support them and bolster them in moments of need or moments of just existence Mm -hmm. um, compared to what might we say that might be a negative or Mm -hmm. something that might detract them from their journey. Yeah, yeah, lots of people speaking life into him. Crucial. Anyone else? Next slide, please. So what we want to do um, here is really um, highlight um, the unique experiences of a student athlete. Um, And so it's interesting, I come from a football family, so Aaron's my little brother, but before him, my other brother uh, went to college, did a little bit of time in the NFL, my dad, my grandfather, so this is like generational. Um, And so right now my oldest is a sophomore now, okay, at Pitt, um, and he's won a full scholarship over, he plays football. And so, you know, He wakes up at five o'clock in the morning and he's, he goes over to the facility, he's working out and he does a lot of extra stuff too, guys, but he works out and then he's going to classes and then he'll work out again. And then he, he does some volunteer work with youth uh, football programming and then his day's over come 10 o'clock. And so, you know, and, and he gets up and he, he does it all over again. And these these athletes, and he's on, that's on a collegiate level, right? But again, these athletes work really, really hard. They work really, really hard. Our high schoolers, same thing. Even with the little ones. I mean, they're in school. They only have 2.3 seconds to change their clothes, um, eat something, go to practice. You know, caregiver brings them home. They still have to shower, do homework you know, and eat. So just thinking about all of those different unique stressors, we really want to highlight. And so these are some of the things that, you know, working with youth and our different capacities, youth and adolescent athletes, these are some of the things that um, that we, we've we come across as being battles for them. So that lack of identity um, outside of uniform, and it's really like they get, you know, um, which makes sense because we do it too. You know, you ask me who I am. One of the first things I'm going to say is motherhood. I'm a mother, right? I'm, my identity is completely um, immersed with, with motherhood. And the same thing with our student athletes, right? Um, but who are we outside of this uniform? Like I'm more than this basketball player, more than this, you know, this football player. And it's already like a super tough time because, you know, just developmentally, you have no damn clue who you are. Right. Um, and then you do, you know, you, you just say, hey, this is what I am and this is what I know. And that's a lot of stress. So um, I'll do the next one and I'll hand it nice. out to you. <laughs> um, stress related to balancing academics, sports and relationships. I know right now our guys um, who are uh, our group of guys right now are sophomores. Um, so- most of them are sophomores and juniors. And so uh, relationships, oh my goodness, have completely changed. Then, you know, so the guys that are in our junior year, we've had them since their freshman year. Um, And I can't tell you, we talk about, we talk about relationships so, 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 so much more in our junior year, but they're starting to experience in these heartaches and, you know, losing their virginity, right? And so these things, um, it's a part of life, but it, it also becomes, uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So anything else to add with that one? Cause we, we do a lot of, yeah. Well, I I think as far as professionals and adults in the situation is 
being able to ask and offer those those conversations, those spaces mm-hmm. where we talk about, mm-hmm. okay, who else are you? What else do you like to do? Because when you put that uniform on, some people have been playing two, three, four, five years old, right? So that's the majority of their lives at this point. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to kind of put away, oh, drawing's a plaything, you know, having other interests is a plaything, but this is where, this is who you are. So it's inviting that opportunity to have conversation about what else might they like, right? So that mm-hmm. when it's time, when the, the retirement eventually comes, whether that's at nine, like in the video or 30, 40 years old, you know, the, it will, you will eventually retire and we all want to have something else that we're passionate about that we do that. So the transition is seamless. And I think for us with that, we had that opportunity to kind of help them engage in those conversations much sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, but going further, some of those, some of that stress also is related to the expectations, right? Mm-hmm. You don't put on the uniform to not try to be your best, to not try to give it your all. And what that leads to is very, it's a very high goal marker. And I love that for student athletes. It helps us become, you know, the people we ultimately become. But the the stress in there is managing those expectations. Mm-hmm. It's, everyone wants to go D1 in whatever sport they're playing. Everyone wants to go pro, maybe want to be an Olympian, who knows. But managing those expectations so that if they're not met, just percentage-wise, statistically, it's very hard to become a college player at any level um, that they're not crushed, that they do have that identity outside. Okay, if I go D3, what else can I do? What else is available instead of harping on what they didn't have, the opportunities they didn't receive? Um, Ms. Akita tra- talked about a little bit the unresolved trauma, right? Your family environment also plays a role into what you bring to the court, to the field, to the hockey rink, wherever it may be. And then if you want to dive into the toxicity of sports culture, right, our student athletes are in a space here where everything they do is highlighted, right? You've got Twitter, you've got parents who who may or may not be rooting for that particular child. You have coaches in in the transfer portal, which we'll talk about a little bit later here. There's so many different layers to it. So we've got to make sure we're we're attentive to that and talking about how we can support our student athletes in that. And I'll turn it back over Mm -hmm. to Ms. Akita. And just a toxic masculinity that exists within the sports culture oftentimes, right? Especially when we're we're dealing with, I guess, with both genders, but I'll speak mostly to, to males at this point, this shut up and be great you know, you don't cry, you don't, and so we have, and we, we see that with both genders, just playing through pain, right, um, and so that's very toxic, and so when we're, when we're working with the guys, we'll make sure that we're talking about these different things, now we're, we, we try to be very mindful of, of using terminology like toxic masculinity, but um, it's something that we talk about, you know, even, L, you know, transgender, like, we talk about all those different things, because again, that, they're immersed in that, that toxic um, culture. Um, and so with, even when we found with girls, it's it's very similar, right? This expectation um, to just push through. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of, or in, in thinking about who we service more so in our prep forward program. So to be full tra- fully transparent, our prep forward program, we are looking for a quote unquote certain type of youth. And those youth that we're looking for, they want it, right? They might not know how to get it, right, but they want it. And so these are the kids that have interest in going to college, going to a trade, right? These are, so these are the kids that we're looking for. And we have an academic requirement, right? Because before we're athletes, we are students and that's priority. We want to get you to college for free, um, but that's true, either academic or athletic. We got to fight and chance if your academics are looking well, right? Um, and so, again, some of the demog- based upon a dem- demographic that we work with, we have a lot of um, teens that um, suffer from perfectionism, you know, and it contributes and it go and then it goes back to that, the expectations and the perceived expectations. So you have these students who are having a 3.5, 3.6, um, but they're also, you know, playing sports, you know, they're, they're doing uh, service, you know, um, service learning projects in a community, which we require. Um, so they're doing all of these great things and they want to be great at all of it. And it really, you know, um, impacts their mental health. Um, so coping with stressors of injury recovery, this one is huge. Um, and Sophia kind of touched upon this. Um, and Trey did too. Like what happens when, you know, 
what we'll find is our students, um, they're playing, they're playing, they're playing, they're staying busy, right? They're not taking care of their mental health, any of that because they're, they're staying busy, you know? Um, and then now they have this injury and they're kind of quote unquote forced to sit. And they're, they're forced to sit in those emotions, what, the unresolved trauma, that grief and loss, they now have to sit, right? And so you have this, this young person that's been super active. And again, baby, God have his way of sitting you down. Um, and so we, we deal with a lot with that. Yes, it is a real struggle. The injury component is a very real struggle. Yeah. But, and also, you know, there is obviously a certain deal with athlete. There's that able body privilege. You've always been able. You've always had your own mobility. So when you don't have the mobility, you can't just get up and go. Then you're, then you have to kind of rely on those relationships. How comfortable are you asking for help? How comfortable are you saying, you know what, could you, could you support me in this way when you grow up and you've never had to, or the expectation was that you weren't supposed to need help. So it really can, injury can really, you know, uh, reveal a lot of different things that a student athlete's already been dealing with. And even going back to that relationship piece, right? Most of their friends or associates and acquaintances, they're also fellow athletes. Right. So if you're rolling in that circle and you, you're not able to, you know, perf you're not able to play again, that impacts your your social social life. Yeah. There's that disconnect between if you're it's a lot easier as a player to take criticism or comment or coaching from a fellow teammate when you know you're out there on the field with me or you're you're out there on the court. Whereas if you're injured and you're from the sidelines, like, oh, it's easy for you to talk. So there's also that that bit of a conflict there that you also have to learn to navigate as well, which mm -hmm. is not pleasant. And want to read Michelle. Yeah. Michelle said that I love that now when going to rehabilitation and or recovering from an injury that provides are asking about mental health, that's a game changer. Yeah. And I'm so excited about that. And it needs to continue. Absolutely. I think we see that more so in a professional and a collegiate level. And that's where we're trying to, you know, I think that locally I'm seeing some changes with the, with the high school coaches, but we still youth football, that's still not a, a topic of discussion. And that's why I really love um, the coaches clinic. Again, I'm biased, right? But I really do love the coaches curriculum because it provides this opportunity that like, hey, let's like, let's explore our little humans mental health um and so yeah we're, we're moving in a better direction because you figure you know we're not where we want to be but we would not have been having this discussion five years ago you know so it's it's much in my in my world it's it's much progression and having people um like you guys <laughs> mentorship program um um and Trey, you know, having, having these advocates make a world of difference. So you want to talk about social media. Uh, yeah, it's a huge, huge factor. It's hard. It's hard. Um, it's hard in the sense that, right, so all the, the highlights are there, right? Anyone, if, if you, anyone follows college basketball, you think of some of the stories that came out of the the tournament you have your Creighton women's basketball making their run you have St. Peter's men's basketball making their run unprecedented Cinderella stories right so all that positive attention but the flip side is also true the day that someone gets dunked on or someone like fumbles a play or someone you know doesn't make the game winning save that's also ESPN worthy depending on how the events transpire so you have to take the good with the bad but also understanding that that's a pressure that student athletes live with it Mm -hmm. my highest highs will be you know exalted but at the same time some of my greatest failures will also be front page news which I think is a different energy and environment than any of us probably had growing up uh, when it comes to our participation in sports yeah. for many of us I know I won't tell my age or anything but um it really you know what was said if you missed a play anything like that it was you only heard it from the kids in your high school you know, now you have social media where you're getting it from, from so many different sources, including grownups, you know, including grownups. And so that's like such a huge, um, huge stressor. And we did a, we did a survey um, with our, with our students. Um, I think it was the year before. 
um, well, actually right before COVID hit, um, and they listed one of their top stressors at that point, this is before COVID, was the social media piece. Um, so they're taking, you know, they're following it, they're, you know, 72% of teens feel the need to immediately respond to text and social media. Absolutely. We see it. If you're on social media, you see how adults struggle with it. Um, and so I just, I just couldn't imagine myself being, you know, 12, 13, 14, having access to hearing what everybody thinks of me. Um, and um, so that is, in my mind, that's more of a unique struggle. Um, and what I would offer just in response to the, the 72% is just reminding your teen, your mentee, or your, your student athlete that even if you feel bad, right? So there's a difference between feeling bad and being bad, right? So oh, someone's going to be mad at me and reminding them that we don't control what other people think of us. And I know that's hard and, and that's a, it's a skill that we all kind of get to on our own journeys, but remind them that, hey, if, they, if they're mad, the relationship, if it's worth saving, will be saved. Mm -hmm. And there's more to life than immediately responding. Sometimes if you don't want to respond, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And you can have that dialogue in the future about, oh, sorry, I, I missed it or I was occupied or anything like that and begin to cultivate a situation where students can say and, and have those boundaries and, and protect themselves from immediate responses. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And working with our students, we do talk about branding. We talk about these different things. When Aaron is, you know, um, engaging and uh, when he's speaking, that's something that he always touch upon. Like, how does he handle the stressors of, you know, social media um, where his stakes are a little bit higher? You know, but we, we, we want our kids, we tell them, operate as if you were a top level athlete, right? I operate like you were a celebrity. Um, and for you to do that, you have to have really great coping skills. Uh, so one of the things right now that is being completely impacted is the college recruiting process. Um, and so we're seeing elevated, especially in our juniors, there's just this elevated um, and sense of anxiety around college recruiting. Am I gonna get picked up? Um, a lot, again, when I share with you that a lot of the kids we're working with, they do, you know, perfectionism is a thing with them, right? And so in their minds, they have life figured out because don't we all have our life figured out as a teenager? Everybody, right? Um, I'm going to go to a D1 school, then I'm going, and they just like, and they just have it all, all down. Um, but what we're seeing right now, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted the whole process. Um, and so, Sophia, can you get ready to pull that video up? So before, um, I, if you guys are, we'll, we'll kind of touch upon it, but right now there's, um, there's a portal. There's a portal. There's a portal. <laughs> and it was designed, when it was initially designed, it was a, incredible. It was like such a great asset. And it was really to help students. If you don't know, if you go to college or kind of like wherever you go, that's tend to where you stay. But because of the pandemic, there were all these different things that kind of came up, whether you're playing, not playing, whatever, right? Um, so it allowed kids, because it was factoring in that life is changing, kids might be going home, all these different things. So they created this portal that then allowed, you know, the college students to transfer. Um, well, in doing so, um, well, I'll let Mr. Dion Sanders kind of <laughs> talk a little bit and then we'll pick back up. And it's a very short clip recruiting classes and we bring in all these let me tell you something the portal now man it, it's it's free agency yeah i feel bad for high school kids because we're only taking like four to five high school kids this year and they're getting the they're getting a short end of the stick yeah the ncaa is going to have to come in and say we got to increase the scholarship for high school kids because why would you take the chance when you already have a plethora of kids that's already been to college, made the adjustment, and you know what's wrong with them or you know what's right with them, and you'd rather go there instead of risk at a high school kid. Yeah, 22-year-old versus an 18-year-old is a very big difference. Very big difference. Yeah. And coaches are getting fired in a couple of years, so you're trying to get guys to, that ready to help you now. Right. Instead, of, no one's red shirts anymore. Yeah. You've said that. Um, 
Yeah. So what I love about that is it is fully transparent. It is brutally honest. That is the reality. And so um, for the spring game, um, I went to like spring games so of Pitt had a family dinner, a family, I'm sorry, a family breakfast before the game. And so we got a chance to, and they haven't done this for years at this point, but we got a chance to meet all of the players and the families. And it was like such a cool experience. And then, you know, coach introduced the, 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 the newcomers per se. Um, and they were the high school students. Guess how many? Anybody want to guess how many new high school? There was three. Three, that's it, right? So only three um high school students received a full scholarship to d1 university that's it three um and so and dion makes some really great points and it's understandable as to why but now again we got especially our kids who are many of them are first generational students they're really really hoping for this athletic scholarship you know and i think the reality of it is like we all would like to put the COVID behind us and kind of start moving into the post-COVID world. But <laughs> what's true and what's especially true for our student athletes is that those impacts are going to be felt across college athletics for years, for years, right? Just between the differences of allocation of resources, access to scholarships, like Trey himself, between his injuries, he was in school for seven years, but there's some athletes between transferring, being immediately eligible, and just being on the team is going to be in school. For, and plus the COVID year, you're looking at maybe someone who could be in school for about five or six years at this point. So that's immediately impacting what's even available to a high school student athlete. And we haven't even touched on the junior college landscape. So that again, the opportunities are few and far between uh, for a a high school athlete and it's helping them manage those stresses and those realities mm -hmm. and that's not and I think we're speaking mostly when when it comes to male athletes because gen, you know when it comes to girls that's even less opportunities because they don't get the same amount of scholarships offered as as males you know so um that's really unfortunate especially when we look at who or who who are the ones that are on who have really had like, so black females, um, the, the wonderful things about black females is that they go into those um, like economics, you know, they go into those like really powerful um, major on those very powerful, you know, going into the very powerful professions where we don't necessarily see um, other student athletes mm -hmm. or where other athletes are usually deterred. So again, thinking about are we going to see a decrease in rates of Black female student athletes graduating? Um, and again, being mindful that they're graduating in those science and math. Does that make sense? So like, how is that going to be impacted? And we just really won't know until it all kind of plays out. But these are all of the different things that these um our teens are experiencing plus they're hearing things from their families mm -hmm. they're hearing like you know and so we literally recently sat down with them and was like let's I know it seems like a whole lot of money out there just trying to not trying to steal your your jay out your joy baby but this is the reality and so we need you to kind of shift from you thought life would look I'm going to a D1 to what might look at like at a D2 what might look at a D3 right um and so we did that, and I think that was a that was a rude awakening for them because it's like, oh, so much money is out there. All these kids are getting offered, and and um, it kind of brought things back to perspective for them. And I think what's also important, right, is that when we talk about being a, a student athlete, whether that's at the high school level or at the college level, is that we we really got to begin talking about that experience as a whole, right? When you're choosing an institution where you're choosing whatever post-secondary education looks like for you, that it's an entire environment, right? So you're going for the major, you're going for the the connections afterward you're going for how comfortable you feel on campus while you're there you're going for the team you're going for a lot of different reasons beyond what happens in those three four five six eight nine ten months you're actively competing I say that because women's basketball season season spans both fall and winter semester however regardless of how long the season is there's a lot more to it than those those opportunities when you're competing and I think 
as adults in situation, we've got to remind them of that. Mm -hmm. When you're choosing a, a, a college or you're choosing some post-secondary education, junior college, whatever, you're choosing a home, you're choosing a family, you're choosing people you want to be able to call up and and say, hey, do you know such and such? Or can, what can I do for you? And and really begin to look at it holistically again. I think we've gotten away from that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Sophia, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are just some of the ways, and no, by, by no means are we experts, but these are just some of the things that we, we tend to do um, to, again, support our student athletes and our mental health needs. Um, so again, strengthen, educate, and expand that ecosystem. Going back to um, you're only good as the company you keep, right? Um, and so uh, giving them a social network. So we bring different people and um, the, the thing with having a parent in itself creates this really wonderful community. You know, um, the parents will help, again, single parents, right? Um, that woman led. And so it's really nice with having that mother who can't get student aid to where he needs to go. So, and so it's really great that that's one of the things that we do is to create that ecosystem. Um, we have what we call individualized action plans, and we do this with our students. Now, we've gotten away from this from last year, but we're picking back up with it. Uh, that last year was a little bit rough, guys. Um, <laughs> but we really like this, this um, IAP, IAP because we look at all these different things. What are the unique needs of each student, of each family? And so we meet with the students. We meet with the families. Um, and it's really us de developing a plan to meet those specific needs. So for instance, if you do battle with mental, mental illness, here are some referrals. We're during this, like when we do our revisions, this is, we're checking in. How often are you, are you seeing a mental health professional, right? Um, and so that's why I really, really love that, that IEP because it also, it, for, for me, it, it also serves as accountability, making sure that we're working towards our goals. But anything that is needed with our students, we're putting it on there, um, including like emotional intelligence. So if the family's, you know, telling us some things, we'll include that in the IAP, and then we'll put the certain interventions um, necessary. Absolutely. And then we, including the integrating that psychoeducation. So, you know, what does it mean to have that exposure to different things, whether that's aromatherapy, um, Pilates, yoga, really getting that cultivating that whole body uh, um, wellness so that it's not a, it's not new to them, right? They get that, they have to get that understanding beyond just what they're physically capable of doing, mm -hmm. creating that safe space so that we can have conversation about, uh, Miss Akita mentioned the changes of relationships and, and just being, being able to be real. You know, I think that for us as adults, we got to be comfortable enough to be able to be like, these are real young people with real issues. Mm -hmm. and we want to be able to, they can bring them full mm -hmm. selves to any type of conversation mm -hmm. we have. And talking to the, talking to a group as a group of males about their body development can be rough, but it's so crazy how again, if honestly, I mean, like thinking about what what the world looks like, if oftentimes, right, it's a woman led household, he's uncomfortable talking to his mother about that, right? Who's he going to talk to? And granted, you're not a male. Granted, you're not a male, and we're not we're not taking that away, you know. Um, but you might be that only person to have that discussion. And I'd much rather you guys talk to them about those things versus their friends, because their friends aren't as smart. <laughs> and they don't know any much, they don't know much more than they do. Um, so just being, you know, having that safe space to be able to talk to those, talking to them about these different things that can be difficult. Um, we do do different assessments and inventories. And again, like the rate them, we do like depression we want to see you know we do um what are their stressors and so we do different things like that and not just with our students but also with our parents as well just to kind of see where everybody's at Lauren and when a pandemic hit we noticed all of our families we, again we had to suspend programming so we were doing a lot of our programming virtually but we we really increased the number of check-ins that we did with our families um, and these inventories and assessments gave us really great data. Um, and so it also gave us a sense of direction of what we need to do with programming. Absolutely. 
And on that same token is that ability, that access to wellness activities, family hikes, um, getting outdoors, grounding activities. We have, a, we have a, tea, a tea workshop planning, just all those different things that go into what does it take to be well, not just to exist, but to be well. And we want yeah. that to all, you know, be integrated into the programming. Yeah. And of course, all that involves the families, the parents, the any siblings that might be there so that when someone else is rising in the family, everyone rises together. Yeah, everybody's on one accord. That's the big piece. Absolutely. Oh, I can give you actually um, when we're we're wrapped up, I'm going to send off some inventories and assessments that we use that are really, really great. Um, so I'll send those off and you can use them at how you, you know, you don't have to be an expert and they're super easy, um, but they're they're really effective. So I'll send those off to you um, afterwards through email or have Sophia do it. Is that okay, Sophia? Okay. Right, cool. Just one personal anecdote. So I work with one of our students and we talked about, a, we did a sleep inventory. So sometimes it's just enough to just be able to ask questions that maybe they wouldn't have thought about asking. So it's, what's the environment that they're sleeping in? What, you know, how, how soon before they go to bed, are they turning off their devices? What's the temperature like? Is their bed comfortable? Is their room comfortable? You know, what else is going on in their day? So that we're at the beginning to understand how everything plays a role mm -hmm. together. And especially when we talk about student athletes who may be balancing practice. And again, with our population, maybe a job in addition, and maybe a couple different teams and different obligations, they all take a toll. So how can we be aware of the sleep, the nutrition, and how it all plays a role into them being successful both on and off the floor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my favorite one so far, just yeah. as a personal. All right. <laughs> um, we provide community resources. So again, we're linking them up to the therapist. Um, we're linking them up to maybe a psychiatrist, but also like the crisis piece, right? Um, when we have a parent who might not, who need, might need a utility, utilities paid, who might be behind on rent, who they need to contact. Um, yeah. Are they watching? Are they a parent? Thank so you. we have had uh, one of our students, he's now at Pitt. Um, he was a parent and he was holding a lot of different responsibilities. Um, and so that is why it is key to have that relationship with, with the parents, right? So say for instance, you have a youth that says, hey, Ms. Keita, Ms. Reader, can you send me some pizza? And he's asking every, every other day, right? Like, hold up, what's going on? All right, I'll send you pizza now. But then after a while, it's like, you know, and you're like, okay, baby, what's going on? And they're just like, I'm just hungry. I'm like, you got food? And then no response comes back. So you're able to call up the parent and be like, hey, what's going on? Well, hey, I, you know, I don't have my stamps for it. And so again, like just having those relationships, I found to be so much more beneficial, right? Because you don't have a car to get here, but baby, we're going to get you in this car. And so that's where that family services piece come in, in at. And I think we kind of operate as, as coordinators or like, I don't know, what the, but we, we tend to operate like that because we do want to meet that immediate need. We have to meet that immediate need. Um, and then we engage our caregivers to education events and activities. So, um, so for instance, we do like every, we have like these month, monthly things, right? Um, right now we're focusing on financial literacy. So they're doing a financial literacy series. And in the past, what we did is while the kids were doing it, we would do like financial literacy jeopardy. We had somebody come and talk about um, credit, right? Um, 401k. Those are all the different things. Again, a lot of parents don't, you know, um, especially coming from, again, more disenfranchised communities, we don't have these type of discussions very often. And so that's how we engage the families, um, where, again, we're not just working with the students. And we, are, we make that very, we, we're very vocal about that when we're bringing on our new group of students. It's like, this is, while we're focused is on this little human right here, like we, we want you all to participate, yeah. right? Um, because it's this idea that, would you send me your contact? Yes, I got yes. You. We just started um, with, what is it? Life After High School, which is a new, we started working with her. It's been, what? Two two series so far we really like her yes, absolutely. um so we'll send that off I as well sure you get that um and just my obviously 
I'm, I'm relatively new here, but what I've enjoyed so much about working with AB 99 is that it helps our student athletes prepare for the long game, not just our student athlete, but our families as well, right? When you're in the ninth grade, you're in the 10th grade, getting to college, okay, it's two years, but there's a lot that takes place in those two years. Getting to graduation, even further away. So it's what can we put in their toolbox now as the collective, everyone in the family, so they can all have that support and that pathway going forward so that graduation doesn't seem as daunting or as arduous to get to. When we were designing prep forward, we really thought about, you know, because my family, again, we grew up in Lincoln Limits, and we didn't grow up with a whole lot of resources. I don't think we knew how, how poor we were <laughs> at the time, right? Um, but I was the first to graduate in my family. And so when we were thinking about um, developing, it was how do we give these youth who have, who, you know, how do we give these youth the blueprint? How do we how do we really get them there? Because one thing that we do know is that students, especially black students, are getting to college at higher rates, right? You know, especially on academic on athletic scholarships, especially with black males, they they still have a really low, they have the lowest graduation rate. So that's telling us a number of things. They and the crazy thing is these schools have so many different resources. They're not accessing them, they're not comfortable, right? They don't, they don't have the connections. And so, and they don't have the skills right? Because that's really frightening. <laughs> that's really, really frightening. And so that's really what we're looking to do is to, to give them the skills that they need to go, you know, wherever it is that they need to go and any room that they go in, they'll have the skills to be able to, you know, network, to flourish. You know, we talk about like code switching. How do you, and which is a, a natural response. We have to do it, right? Unfortunately, that's just the reality that we're in, right? We have to do it, but how do you not coast with so much where you lose that sense of self. Just having those type of, just uh, giving them those, those little bit of tools can make a world of difference. Saying, hey, it doesn't sound like you're angry, which you'll see, I guess, well, next slide, Sophia. <laughs> we'll come to. So here are some ways that you can promote mental wellness. It sounds super, super corny, guys, but these are so effective. Um, one is, don't underestimate the importance of attending their like their sports events, their ceremonies. They love that. Even if you can only come for 25 minutes, oftentimes a lot of kids that we're working with, um, not necessarily for a prep forward program, I'll say, but um, other kids in our other programs, they don't have that support. They don't have that parent traveling to watch them play. So having their, how imp impactful that is to have your mentor show up. Again, even if it's just for 25 minutes and are able to look in the stands and you're there, like that is huge. And so that's a key way that you can support. And when we talk about the, the positives of sports, it's understanding that you, in order to get those benefits, you've got to stay in. So what can we do as adults now? Support, show mm -hmm. up, cheer, you know, give them positive feedback about what you saw. Hey, I loved the way you did this. I loved your body language. I, I saw you give so many mm -hmm. high fives. So it's not all about performance, right? Mm -hmm. It's not all about, did you put points on the board? Yeah. You know, did, how was your times, right? So they get to, they get those benefits and understand there's more that you can get out of an event than any particular outcome right Absolutely. so super 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 if you can do anything nothing else just please be there please yeah. um and then breathing 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 right if you can control your breath then everything else can kind of fall into place I know a lot of uh the student athletes I work with you know they'll get to hyperven or like shallow breathing mm -hmm. and there's not that necessarily that connection especially if you're starting depending on where they are in their athletic journey I'm currently coaching some 12 year olds, right? So seventh grade, there's still a lot of body changes happening. And, <laughs> and asking them to do a sport involves a lot of coordination they may not actually have just yet. So being able to have that body scan and understanding, oh, my, my hips are doing what now? You want my feet to do what? And have that, that conversation and then that breathing. And the guided imagery is so positive, right? It's being able to say, hey, you can create your own reality just by be trying to be there before you get there, right? That preparation, mm -hmm. taking a minute to yourself, that meditation space and try to envision it for yourself. What, what, what's going to be your mindset when you get to there? What's going to be, how are you feeling emotionally? You know, what, what do you need to have happen internally so you should be successful out in the real world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And then um, I, I think there was a few responses that already like alluded to you guys taking this approach, but taking a strength-based and sub solutions focused approach. Um, yeah, there's all this stuff that's happening. Yeah, but there's like, sometimes it's just really empowering just to hear like, all right, this is where we're at. Let's move you along, you know? And so just taking that approach can be really, really helpful. And you, again, you might be the only person that do so. Absolutely. Next slide. So you see this feelings wheel? I threaten the guys with it all the time. I'm like, how are you feeling? And they're like, I'm cool. And I say, no, no way. How are you feeling? And I say, do I have to pull out the emotions wheel? And they're like, no, Miss Keita. And they'll tell me how they're feeling. Um, <laughs> and so that played out. <laughs> That's usually how it plays out at home and with the guy and with the kids, the students that we work with. Um, it, again, it is super, super corny, but I've used this in a penitentiary with like grown men. Um, it is, it's a really effective tool. Um, and so I already shared with you the importance of doing these check-ins. Um, and I'm a fan of scaling questions. So on a scale from one to, th one to 10, how are you, you know, and those are like really, really great methods. Um, and then one thing we, we don't wanna remove is have fun. Please. Like have fun. We do. It's so crazy. We do so many different things with them. And, um, and there's just like super, like, I don't know why everybody loved this aromatherapy. Um, they were all against yoga. They're like, hell no, we won't go. And every time we do yoga, like they find benefits to it. They love it. That's what they were continually working with. Um, but just on board games, but don't lose that, that fun. You know, Absolutely. don't lose that fun. Um, and so we really wanted to put put that in there because that's a huge factor to mental wellness. Even if, you know, everybody has these cell phones, even if you're, even if you just pull out a few funny clips to be able to share with them while you're with them, um, that can go far. Absolutely. Anything you want to add with that Absolutely. one? I think that, you know, the beauty of working with student athletes or in any capacity is that there's already a certain sense of competitive nature there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, tease that out a little bit. What does it look like to compete in ways that they may not be comfortable with, right? So if they're football players, what else can you challenge them to do? If I have some basketball players, I might ask them to do something totally different, like have them juggling scarves and working on some different level of hand eye coordination just to continue to challenge them so that that competitiveness can translate yeah. so that when they get you know 18 19 20 25 30 they're able to translate those skills right and realize oh I remember you know Miss Marilyn had me doing something totally like this 10 years ago mm -hmm. and and be able to recall back to it yeah. and, uh, and we introduced them to four squares <laughs> you guys remember that so teach these youngins all the magic of our childhood all it took was a was a was a um some chalk uh, a ball and and some bodies um so show them the magic that exists one of the things that we really did that the families really really loved is we had our lyrical battle so it was old school versus new school guess who won um both times mm -hmm old school um so again these are just really small things that are you know cost efficient that you can do um to promote that mental wellness uh, overall just well-being absolutely so much. Mm -hmm. yes 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 mentorship is such a it's such a joy um and how you interact with your your humans, your little humans, or it's going to resonate with them. So next slide, please. This is how you can stay engaged with the organization. Um, so we're on every social media platform. <laughs> Ever just wanted to put that out there. But we do have a number of different events. Like I already mentioned, we're doing our mental flex tomorrow. Um, Sophia, thanks for getting some kids registered. We're super excited. Um, Aaron is super excited. He kind of changed things up last minute. He, Rita and I were going to interview him. He's like, let's just have the students, let's have the kids do it. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> so we're really, really excited. And we'll be getting some really nice um, gifts. So that's just a way to stay engaged with us and, and you know, um, 
And if you, if there's anything that you want, maybe there's collaborations, there's opportunities for that. Um, maybe like for instance, with our, our living in a pocket, um, our annual skills camp, mm -hmm. maybe that's the opportunity, you know, we'll have Allegheny Health Network, Ready Nutrition, we'll have other vendors there. So maybe that's the opportunity for you to come and share that space and share your good news um, with, we'll have hundreds of people there. Yeah. So um, that's just different ways. I'm just throwing that out. There's different ways where we collaborate because we're always open to that. We're no expert, like, well, kind of, sort of, we, we got this thing yeah. together, but we, we're not be all end all. Like we really need to be able to work together because we have the same missions. And so um, we're always down to collaborate and expand um, our reach. Absolutely. Um, specifically, if you have any thing that may be, be interesting for the prep forward kids to kind of come and see if you want to come and talk to them, please reach out, please, please, please. We're always looking to, yep, you have our, our information there on the screen. Thank you, Sophia. Again, we're, I'm trying to get them into, you know, as many locations as possible. We got some doctors coming in, some lawyers, some realtors. I would love to have them be exposed to as many career paths and stories and, and humans as possible. And um, look, I got you saying humans. I yes. do call people humans now. Ah, I do. Yes. I be in practice like, hey, human, how are we doing? They're like, <laughs> did you call me humans? I was like, I did. I did. Um, and any questions, of course, feel free to throw those in the chat as well. Uh, but if we don't have any, thank you for having us. And do you have anything else? No. Do you guys, does anybody have any questions? Or, are there anything that you can suggest that maybe we do do? We're open to all of that different stuff. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, well, um, give some space here for others to share and to also give some love for this amazing presentation and the expertise uh, that you both just shared this morning. I, I, I truly appreciate the relationship we, that I began to have with you all and the things that I've learned um, from AV99 Solutions. Uh, so Keita and Marie, I think you do a fantastic job and thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you guys. Absolutely. And also, I would be I would be remiss not to mention this. Again, with our first inaugural female athlete cohort coming up, mm -hmm. we're looking to support them in you know very unique ways. So, if you really want to connect and help support like female student athletes, please, please, please reach out. I think it's super important. I'm obviously very biased. I I grew up here. I'm mm -hmm. from here, and understand the power that sports can play for our student, our female athletes, but only if they play right. So. Mm -hmm please, please, please reach out. We want to make sure they're supported when they get into the program. Absolutely. And if you know any young ladies, feel free to, to send them over because we are still taking um, applications. We'll be doing interviews um, actually starting this month. Yep. Yay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we, we still have some time. So if you want to share, I, um, I will put up the last slide here just as a thank you um, for not only attending today's session, but thank you for being with us, uh, many of you from the beginning, as I mentioned, from February. Uh, so thinking about all of the great partners we've had. Um, so special thanks today to AD99 Solutions. We've had Center of Life, uh, Still Smiling Upstreet. Um, ET3, and then all of our youth panelists. Uh, this has been a fantastic learning experience um, for us at the Mentoring Partnership, as well as the Jew Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on what we can do more to support collaborations like this and this intersection of where youth mental health and mentoring meets. Um, if you want this series to extend, we need to know that. What are some other areas of topics that we can talk about? Um, so there's a QR code on the screen. Definitely feel free to use that um, to share additional thoughts. Um, stay in touch uh, with the Mentoring Partnership and the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. We will send a wrap up of today's conversation um, and other tools. Um, just as a plug, shamelessly, and I apologize, but I have the mic right now. Um, <laughs> Kita talked a lot about 
joy and play and making sure that you are engaging in that type of ways with young people. Um, so we do have a series called Becoming a Better Mentor um, that is going to uh, the conversation for next Friday at 1030. So similar time. You guys are used to meeting this time. Um, and it is uh, going to be a one hour conversation. I'm going to be joined uh, with our friends from Mentor New York and thinking about how to make room for play um, as you uh, continue to engage with your young people. So um, another opportunity, and again, just a one hour coffee chat uh, about what that looks like in mentoring relationships. Uh, so I will uh, stop sharing so we get a chance to, to see individuals and to talk more um, if you wanna stick around, but this has been fantastic. Uh, Michelle, thank you for putting the National Suicide Prevention Line in there. Um, and other information as we did talk a little bit about, uh, we, and we think about mental health in general this month um, is thinking about having that accessibly and being able to share with uh, anybody that we know uh, needs that information. Uh, so I'll be quiet and allow others to share. Um, if you wanna jump in, if not, have a beautiful weekend, enjoy the sunshine today. And we'll hope that it's gonna stay here all weekend. Uh, it's, it's not gonna rain. They got it wrong uh, this weekend. <laughs> it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Yeah, to rain. Uh, we were hoping to do our yoga because um, it's going to be over at Nova Place on the north side. We were hoping to do our yoga outside, but it looks like we'll have to stay inside because of the rain. Boo. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. It'll still be a good time. Uh, oh, Marilyn, I see. Um, we didn't talk about that. We might record it. Um, we'll definitely have notes to come out of it and something we can share though. Um, does anybody else want to share, especially anybody else from TMP or? Allison does. Hi, is it? <laughs> well, Allison, Allison, sorry. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Like I, I really appreciated and really resonated with this message. Um, I was a college athlete too, um, <laughs> but I graduated in 11th grade because there was a lot of pressure to just get there and the, the position wasn't going to be available if you didn't go. And I wish somebody would have talked to me uh, about what I was missing, you know, having fun as a senior and all these things that go with it that I, I probably can imagine you discussing with everybody. And um, I just feel like, you know, this is such valuable service and I wish I would have had it, but I'm so glad that it exists right now in the Pittsburgh area. So like, sincerely, I want to say thank you. I think it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's really cool because, you know, and then you have my mother, my mother who um, had two boys, you know, going at, she, she served as a, as a resource too. Um, how do you support? And again, first generational student, my family, my parents didn't know what the hell they were doing. They were just trying to get us to college. They didn't know what a FASFA was. They didn't have any clue, um, you know, how to assess what's a good campus and what's not. And so it's really cool that they have, you know, and now look at Aaron, Aaron's been in the league. He's the old, he's the old school now. Um, but just having that as additional resource, you know, which is really cool to be able to support the family as well. Absolutely. And um, also speaking as a first generation college graduate, so I have a twin sister. So we both went to college. I played a, I got a division one basketball scholarship and she did. And so it was also that those different stressors of what does it look like to provide for one, but then also support someone who's six hours away. And, you know, those are, those provide some very unique challenges, which is why I say, if nothing else, please, please, please go to your, your mentees games. It really means more than you think. I've been to a couple different games and just, events and it's always the even the coaches of the team that are also equally as supportive that someone out there is a positive role model who's not down talking them <laughs> to the student <laughs> athletes so please go turn up and have a good time yeah this is carol I, I i have a question you said you take about five youth per cohort and then they stay with you for how long until they graduate high school. Until so they whenever they come into our program, as long as they continue to meet eligibility. So for instance, as long as there's a, a demonstrated need um, and they remain at, like attendance, because we have an attendance policy, 
um, and as GPA. So as long as they're putting in the work, they stay with us until they graduate. Um, so this, because we'll open it up to girl female student athletes, we'll have 10 students coming on, um, which will start in August. August. Yeah, the end of August. So do you primarily focus in neighborhoods or can youth come from all over the city? All Allegheny County. Oh. Um, so again, we do have preference for inner city, but we, our students are all over Allegheny County. Yeah. I'm wondering if you, if you plan, I know you only, have only been around a couple of years, <laughs> but if you plan to um, think about developing a module for those youth who go off to college to yes. stay enrolled. Yes. yes. So the two that have graduated from our program, they're both at Pitt. So that has been like super easy. Mm -hmm. um, but what we want to do is now what we when we they both got there, one of them's my son, he graduated from the program. Um, but so what we did was um, they have to sign a paper or whatever so we can be able to watch their grades and also their scheduling. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar but with student athletes, they tend to funnel them in these like, I don't want to say cr crappy, I don't want to be disrespectful at all, but they less rigorous programs so that their focus is on sports. Um, so they're deterred from going to maybe major in engineering when the chances is you're not going to be able to keep up with the work. That's, that's, that's their thinking. And as Dion Sanders mentioned, coaches, while they're really great humans, right? Um, their job is solely on winning, right? That's what they get paid to do. They don't get paid to like develop the students into young women and men. They do that because they love it, but they're, pay they're paid to win. And if they don't produce, they don't have a job. And so that makes a lot of sense. But what we do want to do is um, there's discussions with expanding this into the LA market because that's where Aaron, you know, LA Rams, Los Angeles loves Aaron. Um, and so rightfully so. Rightfully yeah, so. Um, and so we're talking about model, like, you know, taking our prep forward program to LA. Um, so yes, we, we have plans on extending it until their first year of college, but that is not until year five. Um, at that point, all of our babies that we had and our, the freshmen, they'll be graduating. And so that will be our, the, I keep saying babies because they, we've literally been with them, you know? <laughs> um, so and that, your, and your mom. Uh, so <laughs> yes. Big mom energy. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> if, if if organizations on the call wanted to refer to you, is it possible to refer into some of those, to those events or those? Absolutely. To those programs, even though a youth may not be able to enter into your full mm -hmm. array of services, but could youth participate in some of those other events? Absolutely. Again, the Prep Forward program is so small, but we're impacting thousands of student athletes all across, I can't even say just across like mm -hmm. the country because what through Mental Flex, we had kids in other countries participating in that. Mm -hmm. So that just allows for that much further outreach. You know, we have kids coming from Nebraska and all different places to come for the skills camp. So the community outreach, it's much more, you know, we just have such a far outreach with our prep forward to qualify. You have to be in Allegheny County. You have to be black or identify as black. Um, and so it's and also there has to be a, a financial need. Mm -hmm. So there's much it's much more restricted than our community engagement. Go ahead, Susan. I see you had your hand up. No, you know what? I really did not have my hand up. I my okay. my my uh that function just goes off on its own. It's very embarrassing. So I apologize. Um, but I did want I did want to make a comment. I think you all did a wonderful job and thank you so very much. I was very happy to be here this morning. By any chance, are you all um looking to expand your program across the Allegheny County line and maybe come into Beaver County? Oh, we've, saying, go ahead, executive. <laughs> Come on, executive. So we've had discussions with Butler, um, Butler County. Butler That's not County. what I said. I didn't say Butler. I know you I said, said Beaver. Beaver. I heard. 
<laughs> guess no, where she's point, from. It's, just, it's really <laughs> been just, just guess. discussion. So we're open. Um, you know, we talked about potentially doing something that, for instance, in Aliquippa, where we have like a mm -hmm. quote unquote satellite, but we're, we're now at that point, it will have to definitely be our programming will have to be modified to, to meet that specific community's needs, because as you know, um, so yes, we're open to it. Um, it just, I, 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 yes, we're open I just say this, this is, this is how, whatever we do, we want to do it well. Absolutely. So I always say. And that's you, respected. I, I, whenever I appreciate you, and respect that. Yeah. Whenever, what Aaron, one of the things he's known for is thoroughness. And so it's really important is to make sure that we're doing the same with the organization. So what, what right now is my top priority is like, how do we base this because we we got this thing kind of figured out with the guys right I say kind of because right when we were like oh this is everything the, the pandemic hit and we had to shift right some but some really great things happened and came out of that now my focus is on how do we completely support our girl student athletes right and that why the the basis is going to be very similar those needs are very rather different. unique okay. and so it's really important that we're we're meeting those needs so that's, that's first priority. Once we get a year under our belts and we got this thing figured out, it's on. Ready to hit the road, right? Now, okay. let me ask you this. Maybe you, would, would you all consider possibly coming to, we, ha we have a youth ambassador program here in Beaver County that um, um, includes every school system, school, school, um, school, every school in Beaver County is involved in our youth ambassador program. And the objective is, to um, mental health awareness and acceptance. So we had Michelle and Sophia came out and they did a vendor table at an, our event in April, but we're hoping they'll come back in September and do a breakout session for our, um, our school counselors and social workers and just the, the um, school representatives. I, I'm thinking, Tracy, are you still on here? I'm thinking that possibly you all could possibly come and do a breakout session for our student athletes. Yeah, I think that would be great. Yes, I am still here. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> that so would be I, really nice. That'd be awesome. Okay, yeah. so so I can um I'll get your contact information from Michelle and Sophia, and then okay. we'll be in touch. But if you all four of you could look at your calendar, and that's um the date we're looking at right now is Wednesday, September twenty eighth. I'll okay. just I'll just add a little plug there. Please, Carol. <laughs> for, please. Susan, for Susan and Beaver County. <laughs> Um, in that Susan has already coordinated uh, events with the athletic department. Uh, we, we share, we participated in an event where the coach brought the whole team to a, a session on domestic violence, yes. uh, which included dating violence and how, how to um, intervene yes. with friends. And, and so it, I, I think that would be a great space to kind of connect with that coach too and um, begin to think about how Beaver County might become involved. And I'm from Butler County, so I'm not, <laughs> okay. I, I'm a Butler County supporter too, but uh, Susan has been a great, great resource to all of us. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Carol, bless your heart. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the plug. Um, United Way has coaching boys into men. Are you familiar with them? Because we're doing a little bit, we're partnering with them with the coaches clinic, not, not with not United for, Ways. Not, okay, not so that might be, that. that might be a good contact as well. Um, and we can share, I could, if you, uh, once you reach out, I can share that information with you. Okay, I can do that. Well, thank you. Anything else? I appreciate you guys. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Please don't be strangers. We really want to, again, we talked about being a bridge and I think that extends beyond just the, mm -hmm. any particular program. We want to make sure we're connected and we get a chance to know all of you as well. Absolutely. Uh, and also, you. if you ever wanted to bring your, your youth to our events, you are free to bring them and stay there if you wanted to volunteer. <laughs> then you have the ability to do that as well. 
<laughs> just throwing it out there, you know. <laughs> you guys, you guys were awesome, and um, I will be in touch. Um, I'm involved with a lot of youth and uh, youth organizations, so I will definitely be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Have a great weekend. All right. Absolutely. See you guys. <laughs> We're going to hope it doesn't rain weekend. tomorrow, okay? I know, so we can go in outside and do yoga. Ugh. We have a big here event here in Beaver County, so we're 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 hoping no no rain, so no rain in Beaver County, Allegheny County, Butler County, Western Pennsylvania. How about yeah, that? No rain right. Right I think God just heard that. There you go. That's hey. what I'm hoping from our mouth to His ears. I know. Hey. I'm like seal it with the amen. Just amen. Amen. Oh, amen. amen. I'll raise that hand for that. <laughs> Thank you guys. Enjoy your week. Thank Everyone you. have a good Thank one. You. Bye bye. See ya. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. See ya. Thanks, Kiana.